Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard. You're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Pat Alva Craker. Pat Alva Craker has experienced many ups and downs during her life. Instead of giving up, she fought she thought she was her own catalyst for change and was determined to create the life she envisioned and deserves. Welcome to the podcast, Pat. Hi, Kimberly. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I really love uh, your passion for helping people, and you've got some really interesting uh, podcasts out on your website for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and just so people can get to know you, because you um, have had quite a journey as I look at your bio, quite a few really different experiences. So why don't you just start out by telling us, you know, all about you and how you started out and how you got to be doing what you're doing now. Okay, yes, I'd be more than happy to. So I'm a Texan. I'm a true Texan. I was uh, born um, in El Paso, and I now live in Fort Worth. And um, I started... uh, my uh, career uh, in a male dominated field. I worked for IBM and then Lockheed Martin. So I was around, I, many times I was uh, the only female in the room. Mm-hmm. And that was very interesting. Uh, you, uh, become, uh, you, come, you become to um, know your voice and speak your voice and uh, learn how to hold your own among a circle of men. Mm-hmm. So it was an interesting journey. And uh, really throughout that journey, I would say throughout my life journey, there were three significant events that really made me who I am and contributed to um, the book that I published and, and the, the processes and uh, practices that I used to help get me through these three events. And um, I'll start with the first one. The first one is breast cancer. I'm a 26 year breast cancer thriver mm-hmm. and i um, You know, it really uh, made me pause Um, because when you get breast cancer and you do the research on what what the the mind, body, and soul connection is to breast cancer, it turns out that it's about overgiving. Mm -hmm. And I was certainly a person, I was the oldest of five, and I was used to giving, giving to my family giving to work, giving to the community. And I was the last one on the list. Mm -hmm. And um, getting cancer was a a wake up call to remind me how important it is to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I I made different decisions in regards to my care. So I did a pause and I evaluated. And I, in my treatment, I did go down the, the traditional path. Kimberly, I did have chemo and and radiation. And I decided that I was going to heal myself, that I was going to take total responsibility for my health and started investigating alternative medicine. And I went into energy medicine, became a a Reiki practitioner, learned about essential oils, um, learned about food and all herbs. And I began to heal myself through the process. And I was determined that I would come out on the other side, a wiser, stronger woman. And it made me realize what was more important, you know, where I was really spending my time. And uh, I made different decisions. I mean, I um, chose to um, really make myself important in my self-care because I can't give from an empty cup. Mm-hmm. And I started working on meditation journaling, getting to know myself and connecting with myself so that my decisions and what drove me to be to be where I'm at now all came from inside versus outside sources. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm happy to you know, be here for 26 years later that, you know, I'm, I'm cancer free. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so glad I'm here too. <laughs> and so, so as I go down that path, I, um, I got laid off and I was part of the generation, Kimberly, where once you went to college and you started working with uh, corporate America, you stayed with that company Mm -hmm. until you retired. And that was my mindset. That, That was what I saw around me. And when it came to a halt, it was really devastating. And it's hard not to take it personally. Uh, because you start asking yourself, you know, 
What did I do? And was I, a, you go back to, was I enough? What did, you know, what didn't I have? What skills? You know, you just kind of go through this whole thing of where you are not enough mm -hmm. and what caused you to be laid off. And I got to a point where I had to really look at the situation differently. And I learned that when one door closes, another opens. And I accepted the fact that there was a better opportunity, you know, having gone through the cancer and came to realize uh, that there's always a plan. Mm -hmm. And there's a journey and in, in every and as part of the journey, uh, if we embrace that journey, then we we pick up on the lessons that are meant specifically for us. Mm -hmm. And you don't play the role of the victim. You ask yourself, okay, so what am I supposed to learn from here? And obviously there's another place for me that will be better. Mm -hmm. And so I stepped into working for Lockheed Martin Aeronautics, which is another male dominated field. Mm -hmm. And during this time, uh, I found, you know, I became very aware that in those in working for corporate, I didn't really find a lot of female mentors that I didn't see a lot of people like me in executive roles. And uh, when I would run into a woman mm -hmm. and we would talk about our careers and they would share how ambitious they were and what they, what they wanted to achieve, I would say, let me help you. Let me help you. Let me mentor you. And over time, I, f I really feel that the coaching just kind of just fell on me. Mm -hmm. And I had this gift of being able to mentor and coach women and became, um, I became, you know, uh, instrumental in, in that role, even though it was not my full-time job, mm -hmm. a lot of women would come to me and I would um, mentor them into uh, larger roles, into whatever their, their passion was. Mm -hmm. And it became a gift. So I, I started coaching early on in my career, because I wanted to see women move forward. So as I go, you know, down my path, um, I married to my husband 22 years, and he died suddenly. And he and I were running a 200 acre ranch, an exotic animal ranch. And with one ranch hand at, at the time, my, my husband, Don, he and Randy ran the ranch. And so he, they did that full time. Well, now I'm running the ranch. And I'm working for Lockheed Martin and I'm, and I have my coach, uh, my coaching practice and I have a gentleman in a wheelchair. And so as long as the weather was good, Kimberly, things worked out. Mm -hmm. But when the weather got bad, it would rain or it snowed or it iced, Randy couldn't help me. So I would have to take days off to take care of my animals. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it would, sometimes it would take me the entire day to take care of all of the animals. But one of the things that I learned, Kimberly, is that the animals really cared for me. Mm -hmm. And I really had to focus uh, on the animals in order to see if they were, if they were feeling good, if they were eating, if their energy was good, because I was responsible for their well-being. And I just started to connect with the animals more and more and more. And when I would go out in the fields, we would have paint donkeys, which is, they're hard to find, mm -hmm. um, unusual breed. Um, I would go out and then the, the donkeys would just come and they would just embrace me mm -hmm. and they would just circle me. And I ended up learning, they taught me how important it is to have a community and to allow yourself to be nurtured and loved because that's the way that's their nature is to nurture and love their own. And I became, uh, I, I started to really just open up and allow myself to be loved by my animals and they can pick up on your energy. They know what you need, you know? And so it was really uh, eye opening. They taught me so much about life and about business and one of my favorite animals was the pot, the pot belly pigs. We raised all different kinds of pigs. Mm -hmm. The thing about pigs is that they're very intelligent and they're very um, intuitive. And 
I began to connect with them and started to realize and read their energy when other animals or other people came around them. So when I would sell, when somebody would come to my house and I would, they wanted to buy my animals, I would let my, my uh, pot belly pig, um, Nikki, go out in the front yard. And I would just watch her to see if she went toward the people that wanted to buy my animals. And if they did, I would sell them the animal. And if she went to them and then turned away and walked the other direction, I wouldn't send them, I wouldn't sell them the animals. <laughs> so <amazing. laughs> their, their level of being able to pick up on other people's energy was like so precise. And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to develop that skill. I'm going to become more intuitive and I'm going to sense other people's energy so that I can make decisions from here because it works. Mm -hmm. It works. So I became very intuitive and really trusting of myself. And it is through raising all those animals that I started picking, picking up all these skill sets and began, and became, uh, began to really uh, trust myself in knowing that I had the answers. Um, I used meditation. I, I read a lot. I'm a very spiritual person. So I became very spiritual in the way that I led myself uh, through my healings and the way that I chose to live my life. And all these practices that I tried and all these lessons that the animals taught me, I started writing them all down. And uh, when I work, when I tried those lessons and I lived those practices and they worked, I would notate that. And I would take those lessons and I would uh, share those lessons with my clients. And I would say, for the next week, I want you to just totally, you know, I want you to trust yourself and make all your decisions from your heart. Or I want you to start journaling every day and I want you to ask yourself these three questions. And I started to see the transformation in my clients. And I said, you know what, this, this is working. It worked for me, it's working for my clients. It's time to take these lessons to a bigger platform. Why don't I just write a book? So when I first had the idea of the book, it was 31 soulful practices for women entrepreneurs, 31. And when I hired a publishing company and I, I took them my book, which by the way, took me six years to write, mm -hmm. uh, my team said, you have three books in this one book. You have three books here. So I want you to take the lessons that you feel are most impactful, the ones that are your favorite, and I want you to wrap a story around them. Mm -hmm. And that's how... Catherine's Quest, One Woman's to One Woman's Journey to Elation came to be. So is that a new book that just came out? Yes. So Catherine's Quest, this is this is the book here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just came out in September. Amazon number one bestseller. And Catherine's Quest is about a, a, a woman who has three amazing journeys. Mm -hmm. She loses her business, her husband, and her home. And she's at a point where she says, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, I'm without hope. I don't know what my first step is. How am I going to pull myself from this? Mm -hmm. And in the process of packing, she finds this beautiful journal that belonged to her uncle Lyman. And her uncle was on his path to elation. And he was told, if you go to these seven islands, each island will amplify a value, a secret, a lesson that will help you on your journey to elation. Mm -hmm. And so she starts reading it and starts transforming through the process of reading his journal. And in the journal, Kimberly, what I do in each chapter, I have a section called Pat's Musings. And in there, I share my practices. I ask the women deep, reflective questions 
that will allow them to transform themselves through the process. So they become a wiser and stronger and more empowered woman by the time they finish the book. That sounds wonderful. And when you started out with the, you know, the 31, it reminds me of Proverbs 30, <laughs> you know, the one of the, about the woman in Proverbs. And that's just beautiful that, how that just kind of is in parallel. Mm -hmm. The way it manifested. And the thing about if you have any, you know, those that are listening to your show, Kimberly, uh, and that are interested in writing a book, I learned a lot of less, I learned a lot from writing the book. Mm -hmm. a, the, a book is really a personal discovery and journey. That's what I learned. It's, it's a book that you have to write to teach yourself something, to evolve to uh, someone, uh, someone else, someone that's a wiser, uh, with someone with lessons. And, and it's really a personal journey to write a book. And it took me, like I said, six years. And there were many times throughout that process that I just wanted to give up. I said, you know, I just, I just can't seem to finish it. I just put it on the shelf. I said, I'm not going to work on it at a later time. I know it'll be time to bring it back out. And I felt for the longest time that I was pushing a string. Like I was wanting the book to be born on my time, my way. And what I learned is that a book has its own energy and it knows when it wants to be published. Yeah, that, that is so true. Because when I wrote my book, it took a lot longer. I started out by interviewing people for the book. And every time I interviewed someone, the, 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 the way the book was going and the topic was changing and evolving depending on who I was interviewing for the book. And I thought I would have it finished at one time and it just, it took so much longer. And I was just so happy when it came out because <laughs> it is a journey and it, there's a lot of ups and downs, even from an emotional standpoint. What did you learn when you wrote yours? What were some lessons? Oh, is that, I think it's also kind of like my art. I start out with a certain idea, mm -hmm. but when I finish the piece, it's almost always better than I imagined it. I try to imagine it the best I can. But when I finish it, it's always so much better. And I think that's how a book is. It just kind of ripens as you go. Mm -hmm. And you have, you have to allow, mm -hmm. right? You have to allow uh, the book to surface in its own time. And, and um, you know, it will change. Like mine changed, the title changed, the format of the book changed, uh, you know, the length of the book changed, almost everything changed about it, except for the specific principles that I wanted women to learn throughout mm -hmm. the book. And it's, it's a sweet parable mm -hmm. with um, some deep thinking and practices that women can implement and become a stronger leader, a, a lead themselves in a stronger, in a better way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's only an 88 page book. Well, so it's, is, it's, you're, yeah. You're just, you're just speaking my language. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a reader and I like to read a lot, but shorter books are better. Yeah. And um, parables are the most fun mm -hmm. because it keeps you moving through the story. You're interested. Everyone likes stories. So you get interested through the story, but you're learning really deep, deep truths. Yes, so it I is true. It, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun writing it. And it's even, even now I, um, I'm enjoying the process of you know, talking about the book and its impact and hearing, you know, what women, how women are taken, you know, what they take from the book as they read it and how they've grown with it. And they said, I did my, by the time I, you know, read, finished the book, I learned so much about myself mm -hmm. that I didn't really know. It made me connect the dots for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it's so nice to hear um, those kind of comments that it's having a positive impact on, on other women. Yeah, for sure. That is great. So I wanted to go back to some of the things you were talking about during the time you were telling us your story. And the first one I wanted to touch on is a woman's voice, having mm -hmm. a voice, because you had to learn to have a strong voice to 
really be able to be heard in a sea of men when you mm -hmm. first started working. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other women say, you know, um, they, they have been in a meeting and they say, excuse me, and they want to say something or add something. And while they're saying, excuse me, to begin speaking, a man just bulldozes in and starts saying his thoughts. He doesn't say, excuse me, or may I say something? He just zoom, goes right in there. So talk about uh, women and how we can have a voice, not just when we're in male company, but how do we actually have a voice in the world and make an impact? First of all, I love, I love the example you said about the other woman feeling like they, uh, they, they're asking for permission. So first of all, don't ask permission to speak. You have, everyone has a story and something to share with others that will be of value. And so you just start speaking from your heart that what is, which is true. And don't ask for permission. Don't ask for permission to get the floor or to speak. Just have the confidence that what you have to say is of value and just start speaking. And if somebody interrupts, if you're in, if you're around men and they interrupt you, then you can say, um, excuse me, Joe, but I haven't finished. Mm -hmm. And then continue to tell your story. You need, you at some point have to take that power and say, hey, I have the floor right now. So mm -hmm. allow me to speak and I, I'll allow you to speak when you talk. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of start, uh, you know, playing by those rules and it's important to be able to um, really be prepared when you're going into those conversations where there's going to be a lot of men is that you prepare, you do your homework, you know, you do your homework on what's going to be discussed, you know, who the players are, you kind of have an idea of, um, you know, what's going to be said, decisions made. And uh, initially when you go in is pay attention, pay attention to the language that the men around you are using. Are they saying, I think? Are they saying, I feel? Are they saying, I believe? And then you use that language. So when you want to get a point across, you'll say, well, I believe, Fred, that this, this is the best thing that, that we should do. And this is why A, B, and C, and be able to you know, justify the idea that you're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that when you're in a, in a circle with men and there are some other women, then support the other women that are in that room. So if you were on, if you and I were in a in a conference and you were in a conference in a meeting and we were in the conference room and you and I were the only the only women and you would say something, I would say I totally agree with Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And you support each other. And if you're the only one in the room, why not say I totally agree with Mitch? Mm -hmm. So then you start connecting yourself in that way, you're, you're still saying, you're, you're still speaking up and you're supporting somebody else's idea that says, oh, so that's the way she thinks. Yes, and everybody wants their idea acknowledged. Yes, everybody wants their idea. And sometimes it doesn't have to be your original idea. You can build on other people's idea. And that's just as powerful as having the original idea. Beautiful, that is wonderful advice i i love that mm -hmm. and then um i just wanted to ask you about so it's tough enough to you know have breast cancer and and it did help you kind of you know look at yourself and see what was going on but then to, to lose a spouse that is huge that is huge and um i lost someone in my life that was very important to me uh, a fiance and I'll tell you, after that, I had a really difficult time. I actually made myself go back to work and work a lot because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be at home mm -hmm. thinking. Yeah. But you lost someone. You had a, had basically a job, a side gig, and a huge ranch, and the responsibility of all these animals. How did you do it? I mean, I just admire you and... Um, you're really an overcomer. What was, were you just so overwhelmed and busy that you couldn't even think or how did you handle that? You know what, I had a, a, a good friend of mine <clears throat> share with me. He said, you're either, Pat, you're either gonna crawl up in bed and die 
or you're going to pick yourself up from the bootstraps. What are you going to do? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to pick myself up from the bootstraps. And he says, okay, well, let's get going. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> made me see that what the choices were and asked me to make a decision. Make a decision. You have to make a decision right now. What are you going to do? And so once I made the decision that I was going to pick myself up from the bootstraps, I'm going to do what it takes. Then I just started going through the motions and just reminded myself, you said you were going to, you said you're going to pick yourself up from the bootstraps, you know, ask for help, ask for help. And you're going to have to make a decision on what's on your plate, right? You can't do everything anymore. You can't do everything you were doing. So you're going to have to make a decision on what's important and start taking things off your plate so that you are not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So certain things had to, you know, there are certain things that I didn't do anymore. My coaching for uh, a few months, you know, really stayed on the back burner and I just focused on work and getting, you know, keeping the ranch going and making sure that my uh, animals were taken care of. And so I had to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. I really did. And there were times, Kimberly, where I, especially on special days where my heart got just got really heavy. And I said, okay, so I am not going to sit home on Valentine's Day or my husband's birthday or our anniversary. And I planned trips and I got out of the house and I went to visit my friends. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, you need to get me out. I'm going to go visit you. I can't be home alone because it's not good for me. Mm -hmm. So I did self-care and I made decisions to um, be around people who loved me and, and uh, would give me that safe space. Mm -hmm. And I, I eventually slowly really got myself out of that and became um, really learned so much about uh, what really matters and how, how it's how important it is to reach out to family and friends because it's a hard journey to get past that. As you know, Kimberly, it, it's hard. And you can't do it alone. No. You just can't do it alone. No, you really can't. And um, when you were talking about your animals, I remember when that happened to me, um, my daughter's cat, and my daughter lived with me at the time, but my daughter's cat, she would just come and sit on my lap or she would just sit at the bottom of my chair. And she never really ever did that. She was my daughter's cat. She always sat with my daughter, but when that happened, she wouldn't leave me. She just stayed with me for about a week. Whenever I was in the house, she was right next to me. They're amazing how they pick up on, on your energy, aren't they? And then they know, they know what you need. Mm -hmm. They know yeah. what you need. Yeah. It, it, it's really, really beautiful. Then their personalities and they're just so loving. Animals are just so loving. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I think unless someone's been mean to them, they're, they're, they're not ever mean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we can learn from them just to be, just to be in the moment just to do what's loving and what's natural. Um, what other things have you learned from your animals? Do you want to share? Sure. Um, so uh, the donkeys, don don the donkeys, oh, I can't even speak. They're very loving and they take care of, they definitely take care of their own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can go into, uh, you can go into a group of animals and you can start, you know, really feeling the energy of them. So I began to really be in tune to the different energies of the animals, how the energy of a donkey, the energy of the pigs, I was just becoming really aware of what energy felt like, and how, how animals can communicate um, through their eyes and through their sounds with, uh, without the use of words, right? So you become sensitized to people's eyes, mm -hmm. you know, what they say and what they don't say, because that's when you're taking care of animals, you have to pay attention to what, how they're talking to you and what they're not, and when they're not talking to you, because there, that means that there might be something wrong. Mm -hmm. So my ability to tune in and hear and notice what's not being said and the, the feeling of energy really became really sharpened 
uh, with taking care of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, the, the dogs, the pigs, they all tell you what they need and you just have to be aware. Mm -hmm. You have to be in, in tune and just pay attention. So they taught me to be present, to be fully present because if you are not fully present, you miss the clues. Mm -hmm. You're not in your power and you're not really in a place where you can absorb uh, the messages that may be sent to you, the lessons that are right in front of you because you're not fully present. And today we, we, we're bombarded with all kinds of information and television and, and sound and so much that we're, we kind of get lost in all of that. But they said, they taught me, you know, come in, come into, come into where you are, come in and be fully present because that's really where your power is. Mm -hmm. It really is where your power is. And, you know, there are, uh, there are times where you will have uh, a group of them and then one of them just doesn't, doesn't want to play friendly. Oh. <laughs> they just don't want to play friendly and they just cause all kind of chaos. And you just watch how one, one animal can affect the entire energy of a group. Mm -hmm. And that, that also plays into corporate, mm -hmm. into a team that you have as being mindful of how the energy within an organization or a team can be affected by just one person. Mm -hmm. And how important it is. And so what, what we did is when we had one animal that just wasn't playing friendly, that was giving everybody a hard time, they were gone. Mm -hmm. They were gone because we were committed to creating an environment where they all felt safe. They had to feel safe. And that was my responsibility to help them feel safe. So when there was a bad apple in the group, we said, you're gone. Mm -hmm and we restored calm in the group. Wow. So you're getting lessons all over the place from these animals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you're working with your coaching clients, um, do you teach these lessons about the animals with them or how do you transfer that to them? Because it's so valuable. I focus, um, I help them become more aware of uh, what they're feeling in here, mm -hmm. because so uh, so much of the of of the time, we are making decisions from the neck up. And when you're in tune into your intuition and your heart, and you make your decisions from this space, you will make more you will make decisions that are more in alignment with who you are and what your values are. Mm -hmm. So. That's one of the things that I teach them. I said, if I'm going forward, I want you for the next week, I just want you to tune in. And I want you to, when you think about a decision that you have to make, does the uh-uh first, is the first thing you say, or is it uh-huh? And, mm -hmm. and pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Instead of make, instead of going up here first, it's just come down to the heart first. And then to be fully present when you when you do anything when you do one thing just do that one thing with your mind body and soul if you're washing the dishes and loading the dishwasher whatever that is just do that one thing only and just focus on that process and i want you to start learning how to be fully present in even the smallest of things mm -hmm. even the smallest of things the way you stir your coffee how you pour your milk how you pick up your cup. I want you to be fully present in everything that you do. And that makes sense. I have a granddaughter that's two and a half and whatever she's doing, she's fully engaged in that. Mm -hmm. She's fully engaged. She's not thinking about something else. She's not, you know, mm -hmm. unless something big and loud comes beside her and distracts her. But besides that, she's fully engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think we can learn a lot from small children also about that yes I, I i truly agree with that is that they are absolutely fully present and and kids are willing to make mistakes and forgive themselves for it mm -hmm. just like when they're walking when they're riding the bike for the first time and they're learning it and they fall they get back on and you know but they keep you know they try again how many times did we fall when we were learning how to walk we didn't beat ourselves up for it we just got ourselves up and kept going and got on the bike again so 
we as women need to adopt that, you know, it's like, we're going to make mistakes. That's the way we learn is by mistakes. So learn the lesson and move on. Exactly. So I'm just curious. Um, I know when I really needed a break, I've gone way, you know, way out, not just going to friends, but going to another country or going to another trip. Um, have you ever used uh, vacations or trips just to help reboot yourself or mm -hmm. to realign? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if it's just for, uh, I found that a minimum of, of uh, three to four days, I will hit the, I will hit that reset place and I come back into my space just with a different, fresher mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's important that, uh, that that happens on a, on an ongoing basis. So I'm very, I'm very aware of how, how that reset moment helps me move my business forward, helps me become more creative, helps me make decisions on what's more important that I build them in. I build them into my year. So uh, with this, with COVID, you know, we haven't, had, we haven't had the opportunity to really do that, that reset of going out. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned and what I've learned is that that level of reset that I need, I do it when I just go and take a walk by myself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just go out. I don't, I don't put any earbuds or I just go out and I connect and I pay attention to the, to the trees. I look up in the sky. I look down. I'm aware of all the plants that are around me. And I just engage in nature mm -hmm. for 30 minutes. And that helps me do that reset. And we all need that reset. Mm -hmm. However, that is, whether it's you're playing an instrument, mm -hmm. whether it's you're doing your reading, whether it's a, it's a nap, we all need that reset in our day. That, that is so true. Yes, I went for a walk this morning. I try to go for a walk every morning. Yeah. And this morning in the little park I was going to, it had this stream and it's been raining a lot. In fact, even if it rains, I just kind of take my umbrella but this morning I looked in this park in the grass and there was robins and birds all over mm. <laughs> getting breakfast because with all this rain, all the worms were coming up. So it was just covered with birds walking around, flying around. And it's just so wonderful just to see that and connect with that and feel a part of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost like just starting new every day when you wake up in the morning and then go for that walk. Mm -hmm. It's embracing that new restart. It's just embracing that new start and how refreshing it is to really you know, give yourself the ability to do a reset every day mm -hmm. and just learn from your previous day. And every day becomes a better day. It becomes a better you. And I talk a lot about that. I talk about the power of journaling. Do you journal? I do sometimes, but not every day. It's I, I that's one of the practices that's in the book and that I ask my clients to do is to start journaling something simple. You know, I said, just start with three questions. You know, what went well in your day to day? What didn't go so well? And what would you do differently? Hmm. Just start with those three questions. And it shouldn't take you but, you know, five to 10 minutes to start going through that. And in that process of thinking and writing, you end up teaching yourself, you become your own best teacher. And journaling, journaling is one of the, the best ways to become your own best teacher is by just going in and really going through your day and answering those questions. And as you do that, then your next day will be better. You'll learn, you will have learned and mm -hmm. you will have done something differently. And you just start, start stepping into your better self by doing that. Mm -hmm. One of the other uh, exercises that I share is called unraveling. And unraveling is, uh, and this one is also uh, an exercise that I have for my clients as well, is that uh, at the end of the day, before you go to bed, think about your entire day, either from beginning to end or from end to the beginning, like you were playing a movie back and just watch yourself through the entire day and be observant of things that went well, why did they go well? Why did this meeting go so well? Why did my conversation with Kimberly go so well? Mm -hmm. And then learn from that. And then you go, oh, this, well, this meeting didn't go so well, or this particular test didn't go so well. Why did that go so well? And then you start seeing a pattern for yourself and you start connecting the dots. 
And being an observer of your life is what unraveling allows you to do, is to be an observer of your life. And then you can write down the things that you learned about your day and about yourself that help you connect the dots and help you become uh, a better uh, a better leader and um, a wiser a wiser leader. Beautiful. And um, as people are doing this journaling, they can kind of keep building on what they're learning. So do, do you ever have people review the next day what they wrote the night before just to remind themselves? So yes, yes, it's important. It's important to initially write it down and then go back and reread it. And I, I was asked this question about my journals um, in a past podcast. They said, do you ever go back in your journals in past years? <clears throat> past years? And I said, yeah, I, I pretty much have kept all my journals and I'll just take one and I'll just open it at any page. And I'll say, okay, how was I thinking and feeling on this day? And what can I take from that that might help me today? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it is good to review, even even a good book that you think, oh, I love that book. And you go back and read it. And, you, and the next time you read it, you learn more things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've done in regards to that, because I do what you do, I reread certain books. Mm -hmm. So when I read the book the first time, I, use, I, mark, I like to use mark, uh, highlighters. Mm -hmm. So I will highlight, for example, in pink. I'll go through the whole book and everything I will highlight will be in pink. And the next, the next time I read it, I'll have a green highlighter and I'll highlight the di different things in the book mm -hmm. because I've evolved and now I'm in a different place to take in that piece of information. Mm -hmm. And so I can see myself, even as I read the book, what became an aha for me at that point in time on that page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about choices. Sometimes we don't think we have a choice, but we always have choices. So how do we make the most powerful choices? Yeah, that's, that's true. So, uh, so many times we feel, uh, well, many times we feel like we're not living our own life, that we feel like we're living someone else's life, our parents' life, society's life, the church's life. And we end up making choices that they would have liked us to take. And so now we, we're going down this path and we're not really happy mm -hmm. because we're not making choices uh, that, are, that resonate with, with who you are. And so um, every day, even when you start your day is, you know, what, what will I do today? What, will I, what, is, what, is, in, what is in my best interest today? Mm -hmm. And anytime something happens, what I, we're going to, you know, we can't control what happens in the middle of the day, but we can control, control how we start our day and how we end our day. Mm -hmm. So set an intention that when it comes to making a decision today, I'm going to make a decision that is in my highest good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make decisions that are my highest good. And then when it comes to that decision, then you don't, you take the pause and you go within and you say, what, what do I really want in this circumstance? Mm -hmm. What do I really want? So that should be one of the, your, your most used question mm -hmm. is what do I want? Mm -hmm. What do I want? And just be true with that response and have it come from here versus here uh, because your, your ego will start telling you something else. They'll try to, the ego will try to protect you and said, no, well, your, your mom wouldn't want you to do this or, you know, your dad wouldn't want you. And so they start, you know, the ego tries to taint the decision. So when you say, what do I really want to that of this situation and come from the heart and just get used to asking yourself, what do I want? What do I want? After a while of asking yourself that question, then you will immediately check in before you make a decision and ask yourself, what do, you, what do I want? What's in my highest interest? When I make decisions, my personality type is that I will take in the information and I will tell the person, well, Kimberly, I, I like to sleep on my decisions. So can I give you an answer tomorrow? So I may have a gut feeling of what I want, the decision that I want, that mm -hmm. I wanna make, but I will sleep on it and I will get validation that that's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. So 
I want women to feel like they don't always have to come out and immediately make a decision. You can ask for time to think about it, to pray about it, to sleep on it, to write it out before you make a decision. Give yourself the opportunity to really make your decisions the way you want to make them. Instead of being put in a corner and feeling like you have to respond to something right then and there, the truth is you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. You can take your time and make decisions that resonate the way you want to make your decisions. Yeah. And that's a great thing to remember because so many times we feel like, especially if you're at work, what about this? Go do this. Well, you know, I, I know all day I'm answering people's questions. They're saying, you know, what about this patient? What about that patient? I'm having to quickly answer you know, making decisions very quickly, but some, some things you don't want to make quickly, especially right. if they're big decisions, or they're going to change the way a company goes or the way your life goes. So Absolutely. yeah, let's say you get into your day and you started your day out with your intention, but you get into the middle of the day. Let's just say for an example, with some of the uh, executive women you're working with who are in a corporate environment, and they know that they, the way their heart feels, they should be doing this, this way, but there's someone, a supervisor or somebody, somebody's saying you have to do this way and you're feeling like it's not congruent. It's not in, con con yeah, it's not congruent. It's not in alignment. Mm -hmm. How do we handle those things that really upset us that we don't have control over? Right. So the, you, right, that, that happens all the time, right? Because our sometimes ma managers have a specific agenda, mm -hmm. right? They have a specific agenda. And so they're asking you to do specifically do that in support of an agenda that they have. And it's important, it, and it's important to be able to, to say uh, how you feel in a way that will, that is, uh, that will be, um, easily accepted in the conversation, right? Because you do need to, if you're being asked to do something and you're already just fully overloaded and you wanna be able to tell your manager, I, I just got too much work to do this, mm -hmm. um, is to be able to really feel it if that's, if that's what you're really feeling here, that, you know, I just can't take one more thing, is to have that conversation and say, you know what, Kimberly, I understand that you want me to do X, Y, and Z, and I, I wanna support you in everything that you do. And my plate is this big. So what part of these things do you not want me to do in order to do what you want? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, Rob, you asked me to do this and it, you know, work, you know, that task or doing it that way doesn't really resonate with me. What is the end result that you want? And would it be okay if I handled it this particular way? Because this way resonates more with my style. Mm -hmm. and just oh, I love that. that. I love that. What is, what's the end result you want? Because mm -hmm. that's really what's important is the result they want, yes. not really how it's done. Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes management gets stuck on the how, and it's really not important. It's not about the how, it's what at the end of the day do you want to see? Mm -hmm. And let me make that work the way I know how using my strengths and my talents. Beautiful. So I just wanted to make it more personal now and ask you, what is important to you? What gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life right now? Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, um, I have an amazing marriage. And so my, my marriage is very important. And I make this, I, every day I make sure that I spend time with my spouse. So we always spend our meals together. Uh, Any time that we are within three three feet of each other, we kiss. So that's one of our rules. If we're that close to each other, we're gonna kiss. <laughs> and so <laughs> I love that. I like that rule. <laughs> and so it's important for me to continue to nurture the relationship, but because at the end of the day, our life is is built around relationships. It's all about relationships and how we take care of others and and the important relationships and the relationships with ourselves. And so I feel that my, my passion and my mission is to move women forward. And so I want to do things that move me forward in, uh, in, within my purpose. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't fall within, if it doesn't help move women forward, or it doesn't bring me that level of satisfaction, I don't do it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't do it. And the other thing that's really important is a very important value for me is that it has to be fun. Mm -hmm. I need to have fun in my day every day. And if it's not fun, now that particular task is not fun. I'm not going to do it. I, I will find, I will delegate it. Or if it's not an important, you know, if it's not urgent and it's not important, I don't, I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. So fun is very important for me. I want my life to be fun. I want it to be rich. I want it to be, I want to make an impact on people and I want to make people and I want to prioritize my time and spend my time with people that really matter. I love that. And I think that is the most important thing is just connecting with people in your mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I would like for you to share how do people get a hold of you? Like how do they connect with you? Just go over, you know, what services you're providing now and also where they can find your book. Awesome. So thank you for that question. Uh, my website is called majesticcoachinggroup.com. And you can buy, the, we we've been talking about the book. So you can buy the book there as well as a journal and affirmation cards from my website under Catherine's Quest. I work, you know, I work with women and I help them scale their business easy and effortlessly. And it, I, I help them grow their business from here and from their specific blueprint. And I do uh, VIP days, which means that I do, I can work with women four to five hours at a time on a specific project or a mission or a planning. Mm -hmm. I work with them one-on-one -on -one, um, or in a group setting. And I also do retreats. I do self-care retreats and I do business retreats. And if you have any interest on those in my web, at my website, you can go and actually put yourself on a waiting list for my next retreat, which will be in May. Mm -hmm. And then I will have one in September of this year at my home and then in Sedona in April of next year. Mm -hmm. So and what I'm learning, Kimberly, is that women want to be together again. Mm -hmm. We do. We certainly do. And that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, MajesticCoachingGroup.com. I'm on Facebook under Majestic Coaching, uh, Majestic Coaching Group and also on LinkedIn under Majestic Coaching Group. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing all your wisdom and your story. And I love the stories about animals, my favorite. <laughs> The last final work for women is just, you know, be true to yourself, mm -hmm. live in the present and, and know that you're always a choice, even experiencing elation every day. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll thank talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, Kimberly.